we're going to get started. This one really um, is an important topic, and so I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, it's I think it's important uh, not only for Aperio, but obviously all the Aperio projects and our community of campuses and the impact a lot of this, these regulations are going to have. I also want to especially thank uh, Mike Malinkovich, uh, who's here today. Um, and just as a recap, um, these micro conferences began um, as a series of consultations, I guess you'd call them, organized by the Aperio Board of Directors as part of their annual strategic planning. And they were so important and impactful um, uh, on the future of and direction and vision of Aperio that it became clear we really be a service to the community if we open these up um, to allow the broader Aperio membership and, and campuses and, and so on to take part in these events. And um, I'm really excited that we were able to do these. Um, they are, they're monthly um, and we have a lot of important um, topics coming up. Um, a lot of uh, speakers coming in with expertise and experience all across our, um, you know, whether it's an open source issue or a higher ed, ed tech issue. Um, so there's the, there's the list there. Um, and today is no exception in terms of the importance of the topic. Um, it's really core and critical for all of Aperio's member institutions and our projects. And I was struck by the line that Mike wrote in his uh, sort of introduction that, quote, the days of unconstrained open source innovation are coming to an end. And I don't think that's marketing hype. Um, the, the, the impact of uh, some of these regulations and legislation coming through, um, although that's a daunting statement, is true. New regulations and, reg and legislation under consideration by both the US and European Union will definitely impact how open source projects like those of Perio in Aperio's portfolio are developed and managed. Um, and there isn't a better person uh, to help us understand the current public policy and its import to on open source uh, software and communities than, than Mike Malinkovich. I first met Mike uh, when I joined the Open Source Initiative, uh, where he was a board uh, director and he also served as the uh, treasurer. Um, uh, but in addition to OSI, Mike has sat on the boards of the Open JDK community, um, uh, the executive committee um, on the Java community process. Um, he has experience with IBM, uh, Nortel, and he was uh, at Oracle vice president of their development group. Mike has been involved in standards and open source for, I don't want to say decades, but maybe decades. <laughs> um, and today, today, Mike is the executive director of the Eclipse Foundation. I think he's, I don't think he's been there for decades too, but he's been there uh, for, for quite a while. Um, and as folks know, the, you know, Eclipse is best known probably for the IDE that we all know, um, but they also are, are the home of the Jakarta EE, uh, the open source framework for uh, Java application, building Java applications. Um, and they probably have, gosh, Mike, probably over a hundred other open source projects. So uh, over 400 and four, over 425. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit bigger than a pair of uh, uh, projects. Uh, but with that, uh, again, I don't think we have a better person to help us explain the uh, what the regulations under and, and legislation under consideration is and its impact on open source software communities and projects uh, like Apero. So with that, I'd like to hang it once again, thank Mike for, for joining us and hand it over to him uh, for the presentation. Oh, uh, one just sort of logistics thing. Um, Mike said that he's OK with people who want to chime in. Um, and just go ahead and raise your hand. Um, there's a button in the lower right hand side of the screen. Or if you want, just add a question to the chat and I'll make a note of it and we can follow up afterwards. So now officially hand it over to Mike. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. So I think what I do here is I take, thanks for the, the warm words. I, I think I take presenter here. Okay, so um, thanks again, Patrick, for, uh, for inviting me here and, and welcome everybody. Um, one of the things I wanna mention about why, why some of this is so uh, so important to the Eclipse Foundation, just provide a little additional background, is that uh, three years ago, we moved the legal domicile of the Eclipse Foundation from the US uh, to Europe, and we're now legally organized as a as a uh, international nonprofit association based in Brussels. Uh, and so a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about, uh, of course, you know, everything that happens in the US impacts the entire open source community and ecosystem. 
Uh, but I think some of the things that are going on in Europe are particularly interesting um, for uh, for y'all. And we'll talk about, um, I want to talk a, little, talk a little bit about sort of two big trends um, at the very beginning to kind of set the stage, uh, then talk a little bit about what are software supply chains, and then finally use that to segue into what are, you know, these are the motivations for um, the upcoming, upcoming policy changes. And, you know, Folks on this call, you, you don't need any convincing, per, uh, perhaps, that that open source software rules, but I think it really takes a moment to, to realize just how important it has become. Because over the last 40 years, uh, software has become the dominant way uh, in which innovation happens. And that is true regardless of what technology you're talking about or economic sector you're talking about, whether it's banking and, and, and trading, insurance. Um, and it's also becoming um, increasingly important in, in new areas like, like AI as well. So software is becoming the way that, um, that innovation is, is created and delivered. And as part of that, then open source has become the most important part of, of software. Uh, and this great book, uh, highly recommend on how open source aids software and basically software is open source software has become the way uh, that a lot of technology is built and a lot of the and the way a lot of technology is first brought forward to um, to the market. Um, open source is, is the way to build innovations and get those innovations widely adopted to the point today where 80 to 90 percent of the software in most applications or products uh, are, are is based on open source so what that means is whether you're talking about your phone um, uh, actually your web your the webcam or security system in your house um, in many cases your refrigerator uh, you know software is it's the stack that is running in your devices and in the things that you you deal with or the applications you deal with for, for perhaps on your mobile phone, for example, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the stack that's in that is all open source. And this has gotten to the point where you know, Mercedes Benz, uh, you know, a classical automotive company uh, is saying things like today you cannot develop open uh, software without without going open source. And part of the reason why is that free is a really good price. And one of the things I still find astounding is when I talk to people um, that don't understand how important open source really is. Uh, and yet without open source, we wouldn't have the internet and we wouldn't have the World Wide Web. Uh, by the way, in case you don't know, these, uh, these gentlemen are Tim Berners-Lee and Vince Cerf. Tim Berners-Lee is the inventor, inventor of the World Wide Web and Vince Cerf is the inventor of the internet protocol. Um, you know, the fact that their technologies, the technologies that they invented became uh, open and free for all to uh, distribute, but also modify and enhance uh, and read and inspect, uh, you know, those freedoms are a huge part of enabling the technology platform that, that is creating the nervous system for our planet. And this has really put developers front and center uh, into the, uh, um, into how decisions are, technology decisions are being made. You know, I'm old enough to, re, to remember uh, in my early IT career when you know managers and sometimes even executives were making technology choices um, based on selection criteria and, and you know proof of concepts and so on. These days, pretty much every application is started by a number of developers picking a suite of open source tools. Um, and platforms, frameworks, runtimes, and, and going from there. Uh, and so that's really put developers into the driver's seat in terms of how tech, new technologies are adopted um, and become, become ubiquitous. And that, which has really put developers into a position where they have uh, great power. Uh, and you know, some would say that with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that we'll be sort of working our way through as we go through this talk is, you know, where, where is this, where should this responsibility lie? Because the interesting thing about the way the open source world has worked is it has really empowered developers 
uh, both the maintainers and contributors to open source, but also the, the, the developers that are using open source to solve problems. Um, but the entire open source ecosystem has been based on the notion that open source code is provided on an as is basis, um, that there is no liability, no warranty, and you know that the people that are maintaining open source code and fr frankly, the foundations that are helping to organize the projects are not in the typical legal sense, a supplier or a vendor. Uh, we are providing code uh, on a no liability, no warranty basis. And if you want to make use of that code, that's great. Don't call us. Uh, and I think this is, the, if, you, if you're not aware of this blog, I highly recommend it by Thomas Depierre. Um, you know, I am not a supplier. I think this was published sort of uh, late, la uh, late last year. Oh yeah, December 31st, 2022. That's definitely late last year. Uh, and it's it really does capture the notion that Developers who are maintainers and, and providers and contributors of open source do not have a supplier relationship with the consumers of that open source. And that really lied, that that social contract, if you will, has been part of the reason why um, open source has become so so prevalent a way to share innovation is because of that, because of that arrangement. Now, the second major trend I want to talk about is is related because if the world has become very much software driven uh and software is at the center of everything the digital world uh, has enabled a fantastic new opportunity for criminals uh and this is part of the reason why uh cyber crime is part of the reason why cybersecurity has become so front and center in uh in policy making and policy decisions so to put this into perspective, if cybercrime was a country, um, it would have the world's third largest economy. Uh, we're talking, you know, U.S. number one economy, uh, China number two. Cybercrime represents the third largest economy in the world, and obviously, that's that, that was a, a real bit of a mind blower for me, and I'm sure it is for others. That we're talking about that level of of money. And so what we're talking about is by 2025, $10 trillion in cybercrime related damages um, and, and coming, um, coming our way. Uh, and this is, you know, these kinds of, these are the numbers that will definitely attract the attention of, of policymakers. And in particular, software supply chain attacks have increased over 700% over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, so we can all, all recall the, the solar winds. Um, attack that was probably the the really the first time that I think we all sort of heard software supply chain attack is 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 reaching the the collective gestalt in terms of of a term or a meme and and that's really you know been rapidly rapidly increasing so what is it that we really mean when we talk about this global supply chain um, of of open source and and what does it mean to be to be a supply chain. So you think about, um, you know, you know, very typically how software is built. You know, you've got a developer or a team of developers who build some source code, they create some source code, then they build it. But but in that build, you have a collection of dependencies um, that are being adopted because, of course, the whole point of open source software and software in general or, is that you don't, you know, you reuse components. You don't reinvent the wheel every time you're writing a program then that's packaged and then ultimately delivered to a consumer. So where are the threats in that supply chain? And basically every transition, every and every step, um, there is a potential for a, a potential for a supply chain um, hack, you know, everything from at the very end delivering to the consumer. If you can put a man in the middle, then you can swap out some bytes and deliver malware to the consumer. And so like every single one of these um, these these steps um, are a potential opportunity for um, for supply chain for a supply chain hack. And but of course, dependencies, as we all know, is you know really where the rubber hits the road. So dependencies in open source are deeply nested. Uh, so you keep going down. So the, your dependencies are going to have further dependencies. 
and so on and so forth. It's, it's, you know, it's turtles all the way down. Um, and so every single time when you're talking about a supply chain, uh, supply chain attack, the, the, the worrisome part is it's not just the stuff that you're building yourself. Um, and even if you protect your own supply chain, um, at, at each place the, without protecting your dependencies, then you still have recursive ex exposures, um, all the way down the supply chain. And this, this, these recursive dependencies really are what we mean when we talk about a, a global supply chain uh, of open source. And the fact that you know all of this code is freely downloadable and distributable, redistributable around the world, um, across borders, typically um, you know modulo some you know export controls and so on. This has really been what has driven um, software innovation, uh, particularly over the last twenty years. So. Who maintains the supply chain? And I think that you know every single person uh, involved in the software industry at one time or another has seen this XKCD uh, comic about you know all modern infrastructure um, is you know ultimately reliant on this one mythical person in Nebraska. Although surprisingly enough, it often really does end up being one person in Nebraska. Um, and you know this and there's sort of there's this teetering tower. The thing to understand is that this cartoon is wildly optimistic. Uh, and what I mean by that is just, a, um, by the way, highly recommend this, uh, this podcast, um, open source security podcast. If you, if you search that, you'll, you'll find, um, these guys and, and, and it's, it's really, um, pretty, pretty cool. So they've they've repeated this this analysis um, several times for other package managers and the like, but what this is showing is on NPM the number of the the team the size of the team um, that um, that is working on the, uh, the the NPM package, and as you can see the it's 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 a crazy Pareto curve. It's you know, and in in fact the median is below one. Um, so because you have you know in many cases a single person maintaining multiple packages uh so you have um uh in many cases you know that that even lowers it further so generally speaking most open source software is maintained by one person and of course you can say hey well this is you know all of npm um, of course you know the the bigger more important packages the curve is going to look very different and just to show you, this is what the top 5% looks like. Um, and statistically, it hasn't really changed at all. I mean, we have a little bit of a growth, but fundamentally, you still have the same problem that most open source dependencies that we think about in this you know, so-called global supply chain are maintained by extremely um, small teams of people. Um, and th that's, that's the norm. So again, the XKCD comic, uh, it's, it's really worth repeating, is wildly optimistic. Um, we've built this uh, open source ecosystem on the backs of a lot of people um, doing a lot of work in their, in their spare time um, that are now maintaining the code in some cases that they wrote many years ago. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that, is the, uh, that is what we have built. So really a couple of um, important um, bugs along the way have driven some of the, the policy analysis um, that we want to talk about. And I think Heartbleed uh, back in 2014 was, uh, was a really important um, moment in open source history because I think this is the one that really convinced a lot of people that, oh my gosh, you know, open source really is critical infrastructure and it really is in many cases being um, maintained in an unsustainable way so i think many of us here are familiar with the story of how it was recognized that open ssl had a bug um, that the people that were maintaining open ssl which is one of the most critical packages in uh, on the internet um, was a really really small team and and honestly they they weren't even you know really making enough money on it to um to feed their families. And so there was a real focus on, okay, so we need to identify these packages that are um, that are small maintainers. 
uh, and, and ensure that they're 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 provided. Uh, and but this problem still exists, uh, you know, on this the open security um, open source security podcast that I cited a few minutes ago. I was listening to a um, to a, 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 a session a little while ago, and they were talking about the fact that AutoConf um, has not had a maintainer since 2012, as in zero. And AutoConf is you know super important to the Linux ecosystem. Um, and even something that important hasn't had a full-time maintainer um, for for you know over a decade. Uh, so you've you know we still haven't solved the sustainability problem. But when Heartbleed the Heartbleed bug happened, one of the things that people recognize, okay, yes, open source is critical infrastructure. But you know it was sort of a recognition that yeah, of course, Open SSL. If there's a bug at Open SSL, that's really bad. But log for shell and the log for J um, problem that happened um, last year uh, was, or sorry, I guess now at this point, it's late 2021. Um, that was a completely different um, scenario to, to, in many ways. Because in the case of OpenSSL, when the security problem happened, people go, okay, well, OpenSSL, yeah, that's a security thing. Not, su not too surprising that that turns out to be a big problem. When log4j, when the log4j bug happened, and it was a super critical security problem, it was really shocking to people because nobody would expect your, your logging framework was going to become a huge security issue. And the other thing that happened is when they started looking for, okay, where is log4j? It was everywhere. Uh, and so the combination of the perception of risk being extremely low, coupled with pure ubiquity, it's bloody well everywhere, um, really brought home um, to a lot of people that this open source stuff is everywhere and it's a problem. Uh, and so this, I, I can't stress enough how much of a of an issue amongst policymakers, Log4j um, has turned out to be simply because we, um, uh, you know, because it was a realization of how ubiquitous open source had become. Uh, you know, sort of a funny aside, you know, uh, at the Eclipse Foundation, um, you know, well, 14 months ago, we had zero people um, focused on security at the Eclipse Foundation. We now have a total of five. Uh, and when we brought on, uh, we promoted a, a person on our uh, on our staff to the position of head of security. Um, I told him that his number one job was to make sure that I never have to testify to Congress. Um, and you know, when when you have, and, and, and that was in reference to the the fact that the the president of the Apache Software Foundation did have to uh, testify to Congress. And you know, that's that's not a great place to be. Um, and, but it's a really a uh, um, uh, drives home how important open source has become um, to policymakers. So, if you look at this from a from a government policy perspective, you know what have they what have they realized over the last two years? Say, so one is that open source is everywhere. Open source is critical. Um, open source harms consumers and it impacts businesses, and it is unregulated and unmanaged. Um, so. Um, you know, these are especially the, you know, these are a set of problem statements um, that are going to incent governments to come and help. Um, and that's, I think, really uh, the position that we're in now. So unlike, um, uh, you know, the, the history of the software industry and the history of <clears throat> um, uh, the open source ecosystem and community, uh, for the first time, we are now in a position where government policy is going to be something that is going to impact um, impact our, our daily lives. And this is happening on both both sides of the Atlantic. Um, so you, you've got the you know, order to create the CISA agency in the U.S. You've got the now venerable uh, Biden executive order on producing the nation's cybersecurity. Um, and the EU Cyber Resilience Act, um, which um, we will be talking about um, uh, at, at length as we go through this. So, and most recently, uh, as in a couple of weeks ago, the White House published uh, a national cybersecurity strategy. 
And I and I would say that the U.S. is a little bit behind Europe in terms of actually tabling legislation. Um, I mean, there's definitely been some, but there's there's uh, nothing uh, yet that is as far reaching as the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, but there, but they have the White House did publish a national cybersecurity strategy, and I think they um, it appears at the strategy level that they're going in the right direction in the sense that um, they're looking at placing responsibility on uh, the parties which are commercializing open source, not on the um, developers um, of the open source component itself. And I think that's one of the fundamental differences as, as we talk about what's going on in Europe. The, one of the fundamental differences um, between the US and Europe is that the US is a, um, a recognizing that placing the burden of regulatory and or liability compliance uh, on the, the backs of individual developers, projects and communities is inappropriate, whereas the, the Europeans um, have not. All right, so let's turn now a little bit to the to what's happening in Europe. So this the European Cyber Resilience Act um, was uh, drafted by the European Commission and presented to par uh, the Parliament and Council uh, late last October. Um, and there was uh, the goal of the Cyber, uh, Cyber Resilience Act is laudable. Uh, they are the intent is is to protect European consumers and businesses um, from poor security practices uh, throughout the life cycle of what they call products with digital elements. So that's products which are um, using uh, software one way or the other. So it could be software, it could be a cyber physical product, um, like for example, a, an I, a consumer IoT device, or it could be uh, a, you know, a television, or it could be, but it does extend to include pure software, um, package software, you know, like the Eclipse IDE or LibreOffice or GIMP um, or the like. Um, by the way, I have written about this quite a bit. Um, so there's a couple, number of blog posts uh, that you can find on, on my blog and there's that link there. Um, and these slides I'm, I'm assuming will be shared um, as, as well to anybody who wants it. Uh, but if you, if you want to find out more about the kinds of impacts that the, the Cyber Resilience Act is going to have on open source projects and communities, but you know, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of uh, things you can read out there. But fundamentally, what the, um, the, the, the way to understand the, the European Cyber Resilience Act is uh, that they are, for all extents and purposes, declaring software a hazardous product. Uh, and so many of us have seen this mark on devices that we have bought, uh, perhaps on your phone, perhaps on the, uh, on the electronics. Um, some electronics in your house. The CE mark uh, is a is a mark that something conform a product conforms to European regulations, uh, and typically and historically, this has been applied to regulated devices. Those things with uh, with that are using radio frequencies, they apply to um, things which could harm uh, people. Uh, people and you know, so children's toys, for example, will often have a CE mark. Um, and it applies to hazardous products like boilers and the like. Um, and so it's, this has really been the conformance mark in Europe for, um, for many, many years. And the Cyber Resilience Act is extending a CE mark regulatory regime to all software. So the focus on this talk is really about um, the importance of open source, uh, the, the impact of these legislations on open source. But it is important to understand that what is happening in both the US and in Europe is that the software industry as a whole has become regulated. So if you figure software industry, I don't know where you want to start counting, but if you know if it's if it's 50 years old, whatever, through the entire unregulated industry and now regulated industry. And the CE mark extension in Europe is is a, a, quite a tight regulatory regime, um, and uh, this will apply to all software. Um, and um, in particular, 
you know, of interest to us, of course, is the fact that this is going to apply to open source software. So just roughly, what does that mean? So for every software, for, for all of the projects at Eclipse, and, and as mentioned earlier, we have over 425 projects at Eclipse, we're going to have to fully document the development, release, and maintenance processes um, in accordance with the CRA. Now, Eclipse and other places like Apache, um, we do have you know development processes that are well that are that are well documented, but really they're more of a lifecycle model, and and the level of documentation that are going to be required for CRA compliance goes far far beyond anything that we've ever done before. Then for each project. Um, certify that the project conforms um, to the to the policies and procedures that have been laid out um, in in accordance with the cra and then every time you do a release certify that um, that release was done in conformance with the with, with the policies and procedures that have been documented and then in addition for any products which are considered critical or highly critical and this would include things like anything which is managing um, uh, then a highly critical ex a, a product, an example of that would be an operating system for a manufacturing plant or, or something like a, you know, an operating system other than a desktop or mobile phone operating system would be highly critical. And, any, and so anytime you have a project that fits, that, that fits get or project release. And every single one of these is... Um, Every single one of these steps has to be completed for use of the open source project. Uh, now we have some projects at Eclipse, for example, that release at least four times a year. Um, we're a little unclear as to whether we'd have to do all of this four times a year, um, but at least it, as of you know a, a sort of plain English reading of the uh, of the text would say, yeah, we do. Um, and to put this into perspective, I talked to a, a guy one time about, you know, who is in, is in the business of getting CE Mark certifications for medical devices in, uh, in Europe. And I asked him, like, what does it cost to get an external auditor and, and get the CE Mark process completed? And he said it usually takes around 18 months and costs around 2 million euros. Um, and so... I'm not really sure what that's going to do to the software industry, but obviously um, it's that is one heck, you know, just even taking open source out of the equation, that's that's going to be a really steep burden um, for the software industry to comply with. And from the open source perspective, of course, we don't have the resources to do to do any of this. And that's that's a real issue. Um, and who does this apply to? Um, so the the, C, uh, the the CRA applies to anyone making software available um, on the on the single market of Europe. Um, so, and effectively, since we all you know software is now downloaded um, over the internet, this is explicitly and intentionally extraterritorial. So, this just if you are producing software um, in in the U.S. and for a U.S. organization. Um, but you have European users, um, then yes, this does apply to you. Um, and that's, that's, and so this applies to developers, providers of software, providers of digital services, and then notably online marketplaces and repositories. So there are different sets of criteria um, for distributors of software. So this currently does apply to uh, to the likes of NPM, Maven Central, PyPy, you know, all of these kinds of so there is um, a recital in the CRA that would, at first glance, appear to exclude open source. Uh, it says, in order to not hamper innovation or research, free and open source software developed or supplied outside the course of a commercial activity should not be covered by this regulation. And I've met many people and I've read, read um, you know, descriptions from many people um, is, uh, is well, you know, that doesn't apply to me because open source is obviously not commercial. Unfortunately, um, that's not that's not the case. Um, so what this what this recital ten is excluding is really um, very very few people. Um, so what you know what does this phrase commercial activity mean? Um, so this is a defined term in European law, and there's a three part test to decide whether or not something is. Uh, 
um, or supplied in. So the first one is, is there a regularity of supply? Um, so in, in other words, does your project release on a regular repeated, repeated cadence? Uh, characteristics, is, it, is, is your open source project of commercial quality? Uh, is it, and is it intended to be used commercially? Intention is also another one. And if you, so if, you're, if your software is commercial quality and it's expected to be used in a commercial setting, um, then you, um, and you, you produce it on a regular basis, then yes, that does, that does mean that this is within a commercial activity. So ultimately the Recital 10 is only excluding hobbyists and charities. Uh, and as we all know, there's this, you know, sort of caricature or stereotype of open source developers as, you know, people who lives in, live in their, you know, mom's basement and, uh, you know, hack code for fun. Uh, but that's never, that hasn't been true forever. And it's certainly not true today that there are, you know, people who, um, people who develop software today um, for open source are professionals or is going to get used in a commercial setting. It, um, doesn't help, uh, doesn't help exclude open source in the, uh, in the, in the normal sense. So I guess then the question is, okay, so if open source is, is implicated, is that really a bad thing? And I'm here to say that, yes, this is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Um, the, the, the European uh, Cyber Resilience Act has the potential to seriously disrupt um, open source, the open source community and ecosystem around the world. Uh, and it's doing so um, by breaking the social contract that open source software is being provided on an as is warranty free basis um, without liability and and doing away with that social contract is going to cause um, serious disruption so what are some of the potential consequences um, of um, potential consequences of of the cra um, if it's passed in its current form and one thing i should mention is uh, where are we in in the um, in in the in the, the the evolution of this piece of legislation so once the european commission drafted it and submitted it to parliament and the council uh we are now in the realm of politics so the first time in in my career um in the first time in the history of the eclipse foundation we are actively engaged in lobbying legislators um to try to get amendments to the cra to get rid of the most damaging pieces of it um and but if the CRA was passed in its current form, some of the consequences are, are in some ways mind blowing. And one of the things I really want to make clear to everybody on the call and anybody who's watching this recording later, I currently divide the entire open source community into two camps. There's those of us who are scared silly by the CRA, and there's those of us who do not yet understand it. Um, and some of these unintended consequences are the reason why. Uh, so one, one possibility um, is that it would be a perfectly rational economic decision to say that um, uh, for providers of open source software projects to simply say, you're not allowed to use my, uh, you're not allowed to use my project um, in Europe. And of course, that would cause enormous harm um, to the innovation in Europe. You know, how, is, how would that work? Well, I can see this as being done as some, some sort of like an export control, but also simply saying, well, if you're trying to use my you cannot comply with the license um, that says no warranty, no liability. And since you can't comply, you're allowed to use it. But obviously cutting off Europe um, from the steady supply of open source software runtimes and components was, is an unintended consequence that would be pretty bad for the European innovation economy. It also puts European producers of open source uh, at a, at a, as, a, as a real disadvantage. Uh, and that includes, by the way, the Eclipse Foundation. We're, we, we are now European, we're committed to Europe, um, and we're, you know, we're, we're gonna have to figure out a way to comply with the CRA one way or the other, but there's lots of other people that could just say, you know what, this is just not worth it, and pull their, and pull their projects um, off of the internet. Then another potential unintended consequence, and this has already been um, mused about publicly um, by Brian Fox, who, who runs Maven Central, the repository, uh, is, you know, 
distributors of open source software components are not prepared to accept any additional liabilities. And there are specific liabilities and, and requirements um, for distributors uh, under the CRA. So uh, one simple solution would be simply to block block access from Europe um, for the for and from um, those those repositories. And another one that's potentially really uh, scary for the Eclipse Foundation in particular is um, companies that are contributing to open source are reevaluating whether they could or should be contributing to open source under the under the CRA. Um, we've already got one company that had proposed a project at the Eclipse Foundation, and then just last week on a, on on a, on, a, on an issue related to getting the project up and running, they said this whole thing is on hold right now while we discuss internally um, what the implications are of the CRA as a liability as it relates to liability for um, for our company to be a contributor to to open source. And it's important to rec recognize that you know at the same time Europe is highly focused on using open source go on if you're if you're european you 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 probably have heard of these so i guess in last slide and in closing uh, we might have as developers and and members of the open source community have been um ducking responsibility um, or uh, even even though maybe we should have or, or whatever, but those days are to an end. Um, the legislators are going to be defined responsible for these things. And in some cases, um, that, that line is going to be drawn pretty close to the developer. Uh, in the case of the CRA, if it's passed in its current form, um, it would definitely make um, developers responsible for um, for CE mark compliance and a host of other things that I didn't even, uh, in the interest of time, I didn't even touch upon um, in terms of the CRA. So with that, I thank you. I, I hope that you found this uh, interesting and um, looking forward to questions. And I just have to close Thanks. my drapes. I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, uh, well, Mike's uh, tuning up the room there. If anyone has questions, Feel free to put questions in the um, discussion and uh, we can ask those. Um, Mike, I, I think maybe we dropped you a little bit at the end because we didn't see the slide where you and Eclipse um, talk about how you've solved the problem. So mm. that slide didn't come up about, about so, so, so um, yeah. Can, so, I, I, yeah can I, I just sort of follow up there? Like what's, what's sort of, uh, I mean, I know that the, uh, Eclipse sent a, a letter um, signed by over a dozen other nonprofit open source communities. What's what's sort of the action plan here, and how should organizations like Aperio be paying attention and getting involved? Yeah. So first of all, uh, we'll definitely you know approach you if we're if we're doing any other additional open letters. But the thing to understand is that this is now in the realm of politics, right? So this has left the commission's hands. We can't influence the commission to, to change or amend the document. Um, and, and for what it's worth, uh, in case anybody is under the misunderstanding or, or belief that this is accidental, that the European Commission did not understand um, the implications of what they were drafting, um, unfortunately, I have to tell you that that's not the case. I, I literally spent two and a half hours, well, not two and two and a quarter hours talking to the authors of the cyber resilience completely convinced that they are correct and that the open source community needs to be regulated um, and so this is not this is not a misunderstanding this is not an accident this is intentional um, now in terms of what can everybody do well it's it's engaging in politics um, so uh, to the degree that you um, can rally troops um and so what are we doing we're we're going uh in, with the organizations uh under uh, open forum europe is in particular is is leading the charge here we're going to um hearings we're um organizing workshops where we're trying to convince um members of european parliament and or their assistants that this that amendments need to be made um, but that's ultimately this is um, this is this is fundamentally in in now in the realm of politics, and so you know 
you know, blogging, raising awareness, social media, you know, all like all the, the all the things um, that you would typically do to, to raise awareness of a bad political decision um, coming down the pipe is um, is 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 really uh, important to do. Uh, there was a question in terms of, you know, wh what's the timeline? Um, so uh, the expectation at the moment is that the CRA will be passed uh, this fall. Uh, so say October, November, under the Spanish presidency uh, of the of the of the uh, of the council, uh, and in 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 particular before um, the European Parliament adjourns um, for the uh, for the upcoming elections, and <clears throat> um, so once it is passed, uh, there is going to be an uh, an implementation period. Um, that is currently, I think, in, in the draft, 24 months. I think it's been proposed that that implementation period be extended to, I think I've seen one amendment, proposed amendment to 30 months. I've seen another one to 40 months. But um, if you know, under the current form, this would take full effect of law in, uh, call it October or November 2025. Um, and so that's, that's, the, uh, that's, that's the timeline. Um, Tim Drysdale raised his hand some time ago, so maybe yeah. Tim, if you want, you have a question. Yes. Thanks, Mike. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, that's super interesting. Yeah. And, um, there's a human rights element to this that's, uh, quite, uh, awkward as well in terms of the UN, UN Human Rights Council recently had a report saying that, uh, we need a free and open public digital infrastructure for education. Um, and that's effectively a human right. So I'm thinking about academics writing open source software at universities and using the charity exemption, but then running into trouble immediately that uh, the software is released and somebody wants to commercialize it or charge a service uh, fee for using it. And so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on how we might deal with this um, going down the line of these things existing and how it's going to work out when other countries do this. You know, you said the US legislation follows. Uh, you know, what's the right route to plot? Uh, for now, uh, if you're trying to go down the charity route, is that is that even the way out? Yeah, I don't think the charity route is a is a realistic way out. And I did notice some people talking about, oh well, you know, it, you know, the commercial activity maybe that excludes universities and research institutions, and I'm I'm I, I'm highly doubtful that that's the case. I, I don't think the charity route helps too much um, because it really, uh, as I understand the new legislative framework um, in the blue guide uh, that helps interpret that or provides a glossary for it at least um, the, um, the 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 exclusions for charities really you know very 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 you know limited or circumspected they're they're very um, it's and in the case of you know anything where you're producing a decent quality piece of software on a regular basis that people are using to conduct activities um uh i think you're 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 you're, you're there's no out there in terms of and by the way in terms of the human rights aspect i mean there is a there is a bit of a conundrum here too because both in in the us and the european union there's various um either you know precedents or legislation that says you know writing software is a form of human expression um and uh, near as I can figure out, the way that they're trying to wiggle through this is saying that, yeah, 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 the source code, you can write whatever source code you want, and that's a, that's human expression. So that, you know, that's not covered. Um, but as soon as you compile it um, and run it, um, that becomes a product. Uh, and, you know, what that means for uh, languages like um, like JavaScript, which uh, where the, the, the human readable and the executable uh, languages are exactly the same, I don't even know. And how can you how can you one hand say that you know writing your source code is a form of human expression and is, is to be permitted but at the same time say that well if you run it on a computer um that's got to be regulated as a product it seems it seems that there's an inherent there but um somebody somebody um, smarter than me is going to have to figure that figure that out Great. thanks for that clarification on the charity not being get out and also a really interesting take on a the deeper conundrum of the human rights that's that's a lot of people thought yeah you're welcome um
So, Mike, there was so, a com. Oh, go ahead. Who was that? No, no, go ahead, Patrick. Oh, there was a question, and you might have answered this already. So, um, about what amendments might be proposed, I, I think you said that it's the horses left the barn. Um, uh, but is there uh, are there amendments uh, currently being yes. proposed? Or yeah, so there's there's tons of amendments um, flowing around. So um, so uh, I can I should say I now know know more about how um, laws are made in Europe than I ever wanted to um, by a lot. But so uh, so there's congratulations. There's two, yeah, there's two kind of two parallel tracks um, going on uh, in so one in parallel. So one is the parliament, or is the council. In the parliament, there's two committees that have competency on this on this uh, on this uh, act. The first one is the ITRE committee uh, that has the lead, and then the IMCO, the um, Internal Markets Committee, is this is the secondary one. And each one of those has appointed a rapporteur, and and the rapporteur kind of owns the pen for um, for amendments, and people are proposing the amendments. And then also in the council, then the um, different country delegations can propose amendments, and and we're working hard with, uh, you know, with those, you know, um, to get amendments through that channel as well. Um, and we're also working with our member companies, uh, you know, companies like um, Bosch and Mercedes and BMW and SAP are, you know, going to have more sway than a nonprofit like the Eclipse Foundation. So we're working hard. And I think we've successfully um, impressed upon them that this uh, the act as it's currently drafted is going to be a problem, and they in turn are directly lobbying for amendments and or and also working through um, other organizations like Digital Europe and Bitcom to get uh, to get amendments put in. So yeah, there's a lot of different paths. Um, the battle is not yet completely over because in the end, um, it is going to boil down to um, the amendments that are actually passed um that will that you know determine what we end up with um, thanks. um there's a couple so more actually, actually can i answer Anne marie scott's because that's a great question sure, yeah this sure. is moving to the realm of politics to what extent do eu nation states understand the economic impact that this is going to have so the problem is in the entire European Parliament, there is one member of European Parliament who has ever been a software developer at any point in their career. Uh, most of the most of the people that are in, involved in making laws in Europe, and this is not that different in the U.S., but um, are people who um, are for either lawyers or teachers um, or some civil civil community background. They do like they do not understand the technology or the economics of the software industry that they are attempting to regulate. Um, so I think what we're trying to do is raise awareness through the companies um, like, like you know, Bosch and SAP and Mercedes and the like to impress upon you know, their government contacts how terrible, how truly terrible this would be. Um, and it's, um, you know, so that's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, you know, fingers crossed that it's going to have some kind of impact. Has there been any engagement from universities? No, not that I'm aware of. I mean, is do you think is the is the Eclipse Foundation linked uh, linked up with Linux Foundation? Yes. Yeah, so, so Linux Foundation Europe um, signed our uh, joint letter, um, and yeah, we're talking to folks, and I'm actually here in Vancouver to attend the Open Source Summit and talk to lots of Linux Foundation people about this. Um, from my perspective, this is an all hands on deck kind of situation. Um, you know, we need to we need to we need to really convince um, parliamentarians who know nothing about software that what they are thinking of doing is a terrible idea. So Mike, I just wanted to do a time check. It's 1059. I don't know if you what your schedule is. Um, I'm getting the sense it's a hot topic here and people might want to go <laughs> over. So if folks want to stay and Mike, if you're available uh, to continue, yeah. we'd appreciate it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm certainly good for another five minutes or so for sure. There is a question back uh, about um, UK um, developers and providing software to UK institutions. Is um, any, any thoughts on the impact on uh, the UK? 
so I believe that the CRA is intentionally designed to be extraterritorial. Um, it, this applies to US, China, and it certainly applies to UK. The, the mark, the, 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 the determination as to whether or not the CRA applies to you is based on, are you making software available in the European market? So if somebody from Europe can download your software, then this legislation applies to you. All right. Um, could you please clarify? Oops, just could you please clarify what is exactly meant by release regularity and commercial quality? Um, so I am not a lawyer. <laughs> <There's> not, <laughs> You're uh, playing one on TV right now. Exactly, uh, and I've done that before. Um, so, uh, so no, there's there's no there's no definition. Uh, there's no. There's no explicit definition. Basically, these are the kinds of terms that would be interpreted by a judge in a court case, um, would is my understanding. So that, but the the it, it, you know, I th I think let me put it this way: we at the Eclipse Foundation, Eclipse IDE, which um, many people are familiar with, releases every quarter and releases has been releasing every quarter for years and then annually before that for years and years. Um, and has a very, very rigorous release cadence, we are assuming that it 100% is implicated by the CRA. Um, it's intended for use inside commercial businesses. Uh, it was, it's built largely by people that are working for businesses. Um, it is of commercial quality. It competes directly with for sale products in the marketplace. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I think LibreOffice, I think GIMP, I think like, you know, pretty much um, I think the Apache software server, uh, HTTP server, I mean, they're, you know, anything that ships on a regular basis um, that's, that's used in business is, is going to be, uh, is, is going to be uh, um, implicated in this. So Mike, at the, at the beginning of the presentation, you noted 70 to 90% of software includes open source components or relies on open source dependencies and so on. In higher ed, um, I don't think that's too bold of a statement for me to say that there's generally a lack of appreciation of the how pervasive open source software has been deployed across universities. And it's probably no different than other industries that aren't, you know, sort of investing or, 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 or tech, what would be described as tech companies. Um, universities sort of fit that same uh, description. So how are organizations like Eclipse or, or other folks that are responding to the CRA, how are they engaging with consumers of open source that may not appreciate uh, the dependency that, the, you know, sort of the mission critical services that, that rely on open source? And I'm thinking of how would, how might you recommend Aperio and our and the folks on this call engage with their campus administrators to introduce this highlight its impact and gain you know their support in moving forward like and, and maybe that's parallel to you know you're working with walmart or target or you know an organization that's not typically seen as a tech company that would maybe readily appreciate the situation that we're all in that's a good question and i'm not sure i have a great answer i mean we are i think we all suffer from this fundamental problem that those of us that are on the producer side of open source understand that this is actually how the world works. And almost no one outside of the open source community and the so maybe perhaps the product companies that are commercializing open source understand that. This is true in enterprises, it's true in universities, it's true, you know, I, I don't know, it's, it's there's a fundamental lack of understanding across all sectors of society in terms of how critical open source is to the proper functioning of everything we touch in our daily lives. Um, and I, I don't, I, I don't know how to, to, uh, I don't know how to fix that, um, in, in a time scale that will help influence the outcome um of the of the current political process wow so maybe it's got a break for people to realize that they've broken it uh, 
Um, there, we do have a question also that came in for Shoji. Uh, do you have any activities with Japanese open source software communities on this topic? Uh, well, I consider us to be a Japanese open source <laughs> community, and, and we do. And, 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 and Fujitsu is a strategic member, um, and I did reach out to to them to see uh, what what the what the scenario is in in um, um, in Japan. And my understanding is is that there's some early discussions around uh, regulations, but uh, there you know there's nothing impending uh, as of this moment. So that's that's my current understanding of the situation in Japan. I, I'm not I can't guarantee that it's correct, but that's that's my understanding. Sure. And Anne Marie uh, raised her hand. Yeah, I'm just thinking about. Um... I'm having flashbacks to GDPR and the implementation timelines for GDPR. Um, and I'm wondering, maybe I'm like grasping at straws here now, but I'm wondering about if this passes, what are the chances during that implementation phase that as nation states, and I'm thinking particularly France, but, but you know, Spain, Germany, a few others as well, who've really embraced open in government digital services, as they start to cost the implications for the running of civic infrastructure, gov core government digital services, might that have a bit of an impact here? Because they're going to have to rip up and trash a lot of what they have built for themselves for the function of government itself. I, yeah, you know, so I, you I, might I, you might not be surprised. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You, you might no, not be surprised no. to hear that one of the most common um, amendments that I've seen proposed from numerous sources is to exclude governments um, from complying with the CRA. So, um, I'm not I, surprised I, by that. That. That's, <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's, <laughs> I, I, I will resist the temptation to say cynical, earthy Anglo-Saxon words um, in, in conjunction with that exclusion, but that's, that, is, uh, that, that is something that seems to be happening. But what that means is they've costed it for themselves and they understand their is to act on the economy. That's where the big argument is and those big companies, as you've highlighted, that's where traction is yeah. going to happen if it's got economic innovation impact. Yeah. So, and I think the commission, uh, I think the the commission's interpretation of the GDPR, the results of the GDPR, is a you know it was a huge success. The world followed our lead, um, and I think that they see regulating you know regulating the software industry as um, another instance where Europe can show leadership um in this uh in this regard um and but i'm i'm not sure that they understand the unintended consequences of what they're attempting to do well mike we are over i don't see any more questions coming in um one last call uh, for questions um i guess i'd like to offer um, a perio as you know we do have quite a few European uh, universities that are that we work with um, uh, French education a consortium of French education higher education institutions um, so if there are some way that a perio can help to raise awareness um, uh, among that constituency uh, we'd love to help um you sufficiently scared us all i think people are still on the line because they probably fell out of their chairs <laughs> and their, their their machines are just on sitting there blinking now um but no seriously if, if if we can get involved not only to help but you know i i would like to stay abreast of the of what's happening so that i can and aperio can communicate that out to our membership as well i think it's part of the role that we should be playing so please um, let us know how we can become more involved and um, become more active and how we can pull together our resources to help support the effort. Yeah, so the, most of the discussion is happening on a mailing list uh, managed by Open Forum Europe. Um, and right. there's week, weekly calls um, that, uh, so if you're not on that list or not engaged in those calls, by all means, just 
send me an email and I'll make the right introductions and get you going. Yeah, I'm on the list, but maybe we'll send it out to some of the uh, the project leads and, and the university contacts as well so that they, they can get yeah. caught up. So yeah, right, so well, thank you. If, oh. I, if I can just say one last thing in closing, I mean, my mission for this call was, uh, as I said earlier, um, there's I put the open source community into two camps. Um, those who are scared silly of the CRA and those who do not yet understand it. And I hope that I have accomplished the mission of um, moving some people on this call into the scared silly category. Yes. Good job. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, 12 years of knowing you and it's the same scared silly. Uh, so, all right. Uh, <laughs> But thanks right. so much, Mike, for taking the time. Um, really appreciate. It. We'll be we'll be chopping this up into pieces and and uh, the video and sharing it with folks uh, to make the point. And hopefully, we can help um, in some way. So thanks so much. Thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, please check your emails. Uh, we'll be having uh, the next uh, micro conferences uh, always that second Wednesday of the month, and uh, we'll be sending out some more information up there. And we'll definitely be making this video available for folks to share with your projects and with your campuses uh, to help raise awareness and start some engagement. So with that, I'll say thanks and uh, bye to everyone.